Hi, it's Robin again. Welcome back to Real Kosher Family Living. Today I want to talk a little bit about what um, kosher is, what it means. Um, I, um, I know that this is a topic that's well covered all over the internet and um, in lots of other videos on um, YouTube, but I want to talk about it anyway because maybe I'll have something to add to the to the dialogue. So, um, in the first place, I just want to say that um, a lot of people who um, who consider themselves very spiritual, who um, feel drawn to um, spiritual practices or to kind of um, transcendent ideals, um, also will frequently put upon themselves um, laws, rules about what they eat. Um, a lot of very pious people in the history of the world have been vegetarians. A lot of very pious people in the history of the world have um, imposed fasts upon themselves. So, um, so before you dismiss kosherus as um, something that, oh, well, that was for way back when, when food standards were not as clean as what they are now, and now we don't need those rules anymore because now, now we can just eat anything. I think it's important to notice that not a lot of people just eat anything. There are a few people. There are a few people who are really wide open and will try anything and, and don't seem to impose a lot of rules on themselves. And that's marvelous. Um, but I think that for most people, and um, Michael Pollan goes into this a lot in his book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, um, where, you know, w people have to define for themselves what is food and what is not, even just on an evolutionary level. So not even talking about the spirituality of the thing. But if you're, if you're totally uninterested in spirituality at all, you can say, oh, well, um, rules, food rules make people comfortable because then they know what is food. Otherwise, you can just, you know, wander out and eat some grass and that's not going to really agree with your stomach very well. And I mean, maybe if it's wheatgrass and you make it into a green juice, sure. But uh, not, you know, quack grass that grows in your yard. So, um, so I think that there's a lot of justification. Um, for rules about what you eat, whether you are um, are totally unaffiliated with um, religion but consider yourself a very spiritual person, or you think that all spirituality is bunk and you're a materialist, um, and you can kind of see where these rules kind of um, help people out on an evolutionary um, scale. So, as far as spirituality goes, um, I'll tell you why I think it is that people want to, pious people, people who want to connect with, you know, the greater, whatever you, whatever you want to call it, I'm going to call it God, people who want to connect with God, people who want to connect with the universe, if that makes you more comfortable than God, people who want to collect, connect with, you know, the collective, um, of humanity, often will restrict what they eat, um, and I think that goes back to, um, I think that goes back to um, Gan Eden. I think it goes back to the Garden of Eden, to um, the sin that was committed, whether you, um, whether you want to say that that may, resonates throughout us because of original sin, which I don't believe, but I do think that that our inability, our hum human inability to control what we ate, what we desired in the Garden of Eden resonates throughout the ages now, down, you know, generation after generation to now, where, where, very, where people who want to have a relationship with God say to themselves, I want to fix this breach. I feel I am connected spiritually to this original breach in the relationship with God that happened in the Garden of Eden, and I want to I want to fix that. And I think that um, in formal religious practice, 
that the rules for fixing the breach are formalized in the religion. Um, not Christianity, right? Christianity doesn't have rules about, about what you can and can't eat, but that's fine. You, I know a lot of Christians who personally have rules about what they can and can't eat. So, so, And if you talk to people you know, about their eating practices, it can sound very much like religion, like a lot harsher than I would talk about what I can and can't eat. You know, um, oh, you know, because maybe because people feel like they have to come up with an excuse for why they can't eat something if they don't have a religious basis for it. Um, that's not healthy or, you know, that's going to badly affect my body or that's going to badly affect my spirituality. That's all I, I totally, I totally think that that is part of the human condition. That wanting to connect with God, wanting to heal the breach that originally separated humanity with God, that's where these kind of rules governing where people eat come from. So the literary, uh, the literary, <laughs> the literal definition of kosher is um, fit to eat or um, ritually clean, um, and um, and you know uh, clean according to the laws put down in the written Torah by um, Moshe Rabbeinu, by Moses, and um, by also um, then taught, I believe, I believe that the oral Torah is um, just as, uh, as much a part of the system as the written Torah, that the five books are accompanied, of Moses are accompanied by um, a vast, oral tradition that was also given by God, so this also divine. Um, and there's a lot about kashras in there. Um, you can go ahead and read all the details about kosher law um, on many places on the internet if you're interested. Um, so uh, reasons for food being non-kosher include all kinds of things. Um, and I, Wikipedia has a really nice article, so you might want to go check that out if you're interested. If you've always wondered what kosher is, you can. Um, there's a lot of things that make something not kosher, and um, and so yeah, go check out one of those many articles. Um, I find a teaching by Rambam, um, Rabbi Moshe Maimonides, to be really interesting. Um, he says that the Torah forbids consumption of those species whose characters and natures are cruel, and that one absorbs the characteristics of that which they eat. And there's a lot going around about this right now, you know, that you can look at a plant and see what part of the body it's good for. Um, and so, and also, um, there's, you know, an idea in the, in the health community, um, by people who do eat meat, and I do eat meat. Um, I'm not saying I'm part of the health community, by the way. I'm just saying that I eat meat. Um, that, you know, when you eat an animal, you're going to absorb into you that animal's experience. It becomes part of you because your cells and your your body is, is, um, is coming from that animal. And I think this idea is really supported by Rambam. And so... Um, I can really understand where people are coming from when they say, well, I don't want to eat, you know, feedlot cattle. That's, I don't want that to be a part of my cells. So, um, I don't know that I'm there yet, but I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm going that way. Um, we don't eat much meat. Um, kosher meat is really expensive and, um, we have a family of six and I'm trying to keep our grocery budget under $600 a month, which so far not so much, but I know people with much bigger families than me who do manage to do that. So I'm working on it. Hopefully I'll get there. I'll let you know how that goes. And um, so, so this idea then that um, that one of the, part of Crawford is that you don't eat carnivorous animals, you don't eat birds of prey, because those are cruel, um, cruel species, and you don't want to absorb that cruelty. You want to only have kindness and chesed, loving kindness, and, um, and love for your fellow man. So anyway, that's my little introduction to kosher, which I didn't talk about any rules of kosher, and I hope that was helpful for you. Have a great day. Bye.